felt like I was home. It's just mind blowing to be sitting in a room with people that believe like you do, and they're giving you the answers to all these puzzles who had another way of looking at things and they're telling you. What if you were a doctor? What if your soul had chosen that journey and then at some point you realize that you need to expand, you need to look more broadly and deeply at the causes of disease and how it's healed? How would that be? Come join us as we open the door to all the adventures of being human in these times on this beautiful planet we call home. I wanted to welcome Beth Claxton, MD, to the show today. She's a friend and she's also a very experienced physician and she's gone through some big changes in how she sees medicine and healing. We thought we'd find a lot of interest in exploring that and sharing that with our audience. Um, some of you may have considered going to a functional MD and you wonder, what's that all about? And how does that differ from other kinds of healing approaches? So Beth, tell us a little bit about your background. What led you into medicine? You were fairly prominent uh, in a fairly prominent position at one point, weren't you? You were like a head of a department or something? Yeah, we, yeah. we all take turns being head of the department. It's okay. kind of a hot potato that you don't want to have. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I was um, head of the department um, in Flagstaff, the yep. Flagstaff Medical Center. When uh, when I was young, my parents divorced, and I felt really um, like I had to grow up fast and learn to take care of myself. So I realized uh, that I was smart, and I could uh, science and math and things like that came easily to me. And that the doctors in our town did um, pretty well. And so I knew if I was a doctor that I could, uh -huh. probably, like, that things would work out. I could provide for myself. And I really did care for people. I can tell that. I'm a two on the Enneagram. <laughs> <laughs> I studied. I studied like crazy. And I was the first person in my family to go to medical school. There wasn't anyone that was encouraging me necessarily. And my mom actually would say things like, well, you know, you'll have to work really hard if you want to mm -hmm. do. A little bit discouraging of anything. Uh, yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I got to medical school and then I, I thought, well, what am I going to do now? Because I realized that while it was very interesting sitting in like an x-ray suite or looking at in those days, we did um, EKGs. We measured um, increments between certain waves with these things called calipers. And like sitting in a desk with calipers all day, like I couldn't do it. It was so geeky and it didn't feel like there was enough movement. Mm -hmm. And then I did my OBGYN um, course and there was, and it was everything from the first year that had to do with embryology and the reproduction, that to me was where the miracles were. Mm -hmm. The miracles. And so when, when I got into my second year, we had our OBGYN course. It was kind of like all that miracle stuff put together. Uh huh. And I thought, and when women are healthy, they get pregnant and health, unhealthy women can't get pregnant, which is not true. Mm -hmm. and um, and then I did my OBG rotation and they were, they, you know, they were up and running around all the time. And I liked the activity and I liked the subject matter and, and, um, and then you could really care for people. They wanted, they want, they needed attention. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, it worked out really well. It was a natural gravitation towards that field. Uh huh. So how long have you practiced now? in OBGYN and, and then more recently with functional medicine? Almost 30 years. I mm -hmm. finished my residency in 97. So I started in 93. So I started practicing OBGYN in 93. Mm -hmm. so 31 years if you count from the beginning of residency. Uh -huh. So you've probably delivered a lot of babies. I have. And I I don't count. We counted for a birth certification and 
it was like two or 3000. And I, I thought, okay, like, wow. We don't deliver at the intensity that we did in residency, but it's been a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that probably means coming out in the middle of the night and, and really uh, stepping up to the plate a lot of times, maybe in other specialties, you wouldn't have to do that kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's, that's the hardest part. And now I wonder why someone who loves sleep so much went into the field. <laughs> that would be you. <laughs> <laughs> I know in my own birth, my uh, the nurses told my mother to hold back actually for a couple of hours because the doctor wasn't ready to come. You know, so I was born at four at five forty five a.m. But I, I don't think that was a good kind of birth. <laughs> I can't believe that someone would be told to do that. Yeah, that that would be not something typically done. Eh? <laughs> well, sometimes they'll say like, "Don't push," uh huh, because they don't want to proactively get the baby there. If the provider isn't there, but yeah, like hold on for two hours. I've found issues when I've done psychological work. There's issues there, like not feeling welcome in the world. It's mm. interesting because you know I, I have read books about how a lot of psychological issues begin at birth. Mm -hmm. Have to do with those kind, but they seem to go back even deeper to other lives. That's a whole other topic, but right. um, you know, fun, core beliefs and things can be expressed in, in the manner of one's birth. It would seem. And a lot happens at birth. We're exposed to our microbiome, whether that's mm -hmm. delivery through the birth canal or via C-section. And that's when we like really start to wake up in the world, you know, uh -huh. to this is our life. And that, colon that initial colonization of bacteria uh -huh. really sets the stage for our immune system. And that must be really different between a C-section and a you know, vaginal birth. It can be very different. Uh -huh. Oh, it's like little magnets when we come out. So if we're born through the birth canal, then we all we are, we have all these bacteria on us that we're supposed to have that are supposed to colonize our guts. And if huh? we are born C-section, then we come out into the sterile environment, and we're exposed to these bacteria. And some of them only grow in hospitals, mm. and Ooh. and you yeah. know the maybe the nurses that are touching us, like we get those kind of bacteria stuck on us so oh. it's very different maybe take us a little bit how you got into functional medicine when you did that because we're getting into the zone of underlying causes I imagine some underlying causes by being colonized inappropriately at the beginning exactly I realized um gosh maybe even in residency but pretty early on in my career that I didn't have all the answers that medical school had not taught me all the answers <laughs> and that a lot of times people didn't want a pill. They wanted connection. They wanted direction. They wanted some handholding. And that was really all they needed. Some mm -hmm. people just needed to drink more water. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, and one, I remember one woman got really mad at me. She drove for a couple hours to an appointment. And I said, I think the first step is for you to drink the proper amount of water every day. Wow. She said, I drove two hours for you to tell me to drink more water. And I said, I think that's the best first step. And she came back and she said that fixed it. Wow. That's amazing. Is there a, a proper amount of water that you would suggest for people in general? I mean, I've heard amounts as high as a gallon a day, which seems excessive, but. Well, you take your weight in pounds and divide that in half. And that's how many ounces roughly. So if you're just so you weighed 130, then, well, because I say 140, that's easier to divide. So let's say 70, so 70 ounces, that's more than a gallon. Yeah. For, for someone like me. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of water to drink. A lot of water. And then yeah. we're, and we have to watch electrolytes and, you know, we live in a really dry environment. So maybe a little bit more and watching the electrolytes. We don't have our own IV drips, right? <laughs> right we don't. I make my own electrolytes and it's a recipe online. Oh yeah. From a, yeah. From an elect, from a supplement company, a hydration company that mm -hmm. Or formula online. And I have a scoop of that every day. I could probably have more. If my calves are cramping, then I know I need some more. Yeah. Well, we could put a link down below to that. Okay. Might yeah. be a, that's that magnesium and potassium and yes. salts and mm -hmm. sodium. A lot of people I think are rather deficient in potassium, aren't they? Yeah. Magnesium, magnesium. Both. magnesium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, 
I imagine some of that could tie back to perhaps demineralization of the soil. Yeah. We were getting into what led you into exploring mm -hmm. functional medicine and what mm -hmm. you've learned from it and, and uh, what differences you may have seen in people's health. Yeah. So I, I realized I hadn't learned everything I needed to learn. And, and then the situations became more complex and the remedy that Western medicine, Western OBGYN offered seemed like a Band-Aid. Uh -huh. And then at one point I realized I was really just saving people from themselves because there was a lot of poor decision-making and lifestyle that was leading to disease. Like I could see it in front of my eyes. And I, I thought this is so frustrating. I, it wasn't practicing medicine. It was uh -huh. more rescuing people from their bad decisions. There was a premonition. I was out running one morning and I got the, received this download that said, you're going to open a clinic in Flagstaff well, uh, with holistic practitioners. And I said, okay. And I asked around, there was a woman in town who had done something similar. And I remember people really liked her and she'd left Flagstaff. And so I called her and I talked to her and she said, you need to study through the Institute for Functional Medicine. And I said, okay. And I looked them up and joined and did all their free CME right away and just started at the first meeting was probably maybe a month after that. Mm -hmm. and I went and I studied and um, it was so transformative. It, it felt like I was home and oh. that's how it feels to a lot of providers that are there. It's just mind blowing to be sitting in a room with people that believe like you do. And they're giving you the answers to all these puzzles that yeah. you do had another way of looking at things and they're telling you. How would you define functional medicine for those that may be unfamiliar with it? So functional medicine is a, there are three, we call them three legs of the stool. The <laughs> first one is a provider patient collaboration. Like mm -hmm. I'm telling you to take this medicine. We are sitting down and we're creating a plan together mm -hmm. based on what you're willing to, what, what each person is willing to do at that point in their lives. And then it's a systems-based approach. This so like total health. Like OBGYNs look at the female genital tract and mm -hmm. that's about it. Well, really like everything's connected to that. It's that sits right next to the intestines and the kidney right. and the bladder. And it's controlled by hormones in the brain and it's all connected and there, you know, what are the inflammatory repercussions that show up in the female reproductive system? How does that look? How does inflammation look? That mindset. Like you're looking at the, the general functions of the, of the whole body, at all the different systems and how they interrelate, right? Yes. And, yes. And like the inner workings of a clock with all the cog wheels that are turning that's what functional medicine is like. Is that generally focusing on physical, let's just say physical aspects, or does it also include more of the spiritual, attitudinal, psychological, et cetera, aspects of life? I'll show you what we use when we're evaluating a patient. So yes, it, it looks at physical and it also looks at mental, emotional, spiritual, and you can uh -huh. see the mental, emotional, spiritual yeah. or, and this mm -hmm. is digestion. This is the immune system. These are mitochondria. This is toxicity. This is like cardio metabolic. Mm -hmm. Communication meaning between parts of the body. That, that's hormones and neurotransmitters. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. so everything's communicating. Yeah. So all of that is informed by the mental, emotional, spiritual core. And down here at the bottom are the five modifiable lifestyle factors. So uh -huh. it's sleep and relaxation, mm -hmm. exercise and movement, nutrition, stress, and our relationships. Mm -hmm. Because those are the five top things that inform 
how our health really. Right. And imagine like under stress, you could go in relationships, you could probably, that's probably where all that psychological and self-understanding uh, kinds of things would come in. I can't do. Part of it. Yeah. I remember when I was in, when I was married, I felt a lot of resistance, which I think was my intuition telling me to go in a different direction, but I wasn't listening. And so I was foraging on to stay in this relationship and I had a mass on my ovary. And then shortly thereafter, I had a mass on my breast and both of which were benign. And I knew that some something in the direction that I was going needed to change. Probably the next time it wasn't going to be benign. Like your body was talking to you in a way. Yeah, those were signals. Those were messages. It's interesting. I took a workshop one time in body symbology by a woman who was more of a spiritual healer. And, you know, she would say like things on the right side of the body or the left side of the body would refer to like a relationship with a man or a, or a or masculine part, say on your right side and things like that. It was It was in breast to do with nurturing and who knows, you know, but I don't know if you've explored any of that or you find much validity to that kind of thing or not. Louise Hay talks about a lot of that too. Right. Right. And these were both on the left side. So these were both on my feminine side. Huh? Yeah. Hmm. My feminine. And your feminine side was feeling maybe ready to move on. Maybe something was toxic or not working. Yeah. yeah. Right. So you saw the, his masses, his organs. And so, did that prompt you then to go deeper and look at some other changes or did you go through the conventional route at that point? Or I went through the conventional route because that was the paradigm I, I was living in and I did and I made sure that they weren't cancer. I had young children at that time and um, I wanted to, you know, make sure. I didn't right. want to mess around, make sure. And, but I, there was something, I just knew that something, this was a sign to change. Uh -huh. something. Where did you take it from there? Well, this is interesting that you had asked. So when I, um, the ovary came out first and then the breast mass happened. And I remember being in the suite where I had the radiological test to mm -hmm. see if it was cancer in the breast. And I didn't know. So I remember sitting and waiting for the radiologist to come in. And I am I think it was having a conversation with a divine. And I said, I don't know what door I'm going to walk through. I don't know if I'm going to go across the street to the cancer center or if I'm going to be free. Yeah. If I don't have cancer, I will follow direction. Mm -hmm. Follow guidance. Well. Wow. So you turned out not to have it. That must have been quite a relief, first of all. Yes. yes. <laughs> so then how did following guidance work out from there? So then I can't remember what came first. I I think I decided with my husband at the time to get a divorce. That was like a month or two later. And then um, once I was out of that relationship, I could open up and take, you know, listen for divine guidance and, mm -hmm. and things like the, when they told me to open my clinic and a similar thing happened um, about a year and a half ago when I came to Sedona and I got out of the car and they said, this is where, this is where you do your work. Yeah. Wow. I said, okay. So I, I just, I know that everything's going to work out when I listen to that guidance and without resistance is this still pretty new for you then to practice be practicing functional medicine just a, two or three years or something like that or 2018 is when i started so uh -huh. yeah and Six then came COVID. <laughs> right right wow. that did i took my exam in lockdown well just curious what did you make of that as a inquiring person and and as an md when all that rolled out, did you kind of come down more on the side of, I mean, we just kind of watching and waiting or did it seem like it was a really serious pandemic as they were presenting that required all the steps that were taken and all that or, or what? I mean, how did you see that? Yeah. So it was towards the end of February and I was finishing um, working at a small hospital. I was finishing my week there 
and my throat was kind of sore. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was coughing and I didn't feel very good. And then I went to Las Vegas to a convention, a laser convention that following weekend. And I had a pretty nasty cough. No, it was, it was February 28th to March 1st. Mm -hmm. So I, I was at that laser convention and I remember just sitting like in the back of the room, just drinking hot tea because I didn't feel very good. And then I came home and the next Monday I was seeing patients before I went back to the hospital and I thought, gosh, I really don't feel good. And I took my temperature and it was like 102. Oh. And so I canceled the rest of my day. I drove out to the hospital and I called them and I said, just cancel everything this week. I'll be here only for emergencies. Mm -hmm. And I was in bed all week, lost taste, lost smell, horrible, horrible cough. And this was still early March. Didn't quite know what to call it other than a bad cold or something. I said, gosh, I just have never been this sick. And I was really, I was, I had like, I think I went to the store once and got some juice and I made a pot of lentil soup and that's all I had to eat for a week oh. and a lot of water. And, um, I had a tube of glutathione that I happened to be taking twice a day and slept a lot. And at sort of towards the end of that week, I was starting to come around. I remember I got up in the morning, took a shower the day that I was leaving and the stock market was going crazy. That was when they shut the stock market down because it was starting to crash. And then that next week is when everything started locking down. Yeah. And I still didn't realize that I had had COVID until like maybe months later. When they started tying those symptoms like loss of smell and things like that in taste. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, we had we picked it up. We probably brought it over to the United States really. <laughs> we were in France in November 2019, and you know we're in a number of Chinese restaurants actually, and um, got both of us bad coughs and had to stay longer on our trip and delay the return because we were afraid we'd get pneumonia trying to travel home. And then we had a prolonged cough, both of us it lasted two or three months after we got home. Yeah, so that we never were tested, you know. We, we pretty early got onto the idea that the PCR test was not really accurate and so on, according to its founder. So yeah, we just figured, well, we're immune now. <laughs> yeah, we were out of that window of yeah. being closed because I did go and tried to get tested, but I was out of that window. Yeah. And then I think when the antibodies test tests came out, I think I made a different type of antibody. I didn't make the B cell mediated antibodies. I made T cell mediated antibodies and I wasn't testing positive for those either, but mm. I, I had every single symptom of well, COVID. Have you had it since? No. Yeah, I haven't either. I imagine that that was really a difficult time for being in the medical profession with all the crackdowns kind of that came, I mean, not only on the general population, but I mean, a lot of MDs who questioned anything seemed like were, they were being given a hard time. Yeah, it was pretty terrifying, actually, to know that I had to go to the hospital and, and still not really knowing if I had had right. the infection or not. Mm -hmm. If you were truly immune or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard this also from, from my nephew, who's a pulmonologist in the ICU. Oh, yeah. A mm -hmm. Big exposure. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it took a lot of bravery, especially early on, not really knowing you know, how severe it would be and how contagious it was and all that to, to function. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, sure. people are dying. And where you practice, there's a lot of Navajo, I imagine. I mean, I heard there was a lot of impact on the reservation. It's huge. It's huge. Yeah. And I would imagine, but I don't know, that probably a lot of that might have been, been tied in some of the risk factors of, you know, comorbidities like, you know, obesity or poor diet or, yeah, you know, diabetes, things like that. Exactly. You know? exactly. But at that point, you were still just in the, your specialty and probably didn't see you know, OBGYN and didn't see that much of that, or did you? Well, the hospital was so small that there, four, there were four labor rooms and on either side it was the rest of the hospital, like oh. in the same hallway. You couldn't, you couldn't have missed what was going on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. They'd 
taped some, they duct taped some tarps up in the hall to try to separate the, oh. you know. Oh, oh. So moving back to where we were with the functional medicine, I mean, how do you even begin to approach all that? You have an, an in-depth interview at the beginning. Right. So it, a lot of intuition is used as well. It's getting to know the person is is very, very important. Getting to know their background, their life, mm -hmm. how they were born, vaginal birth, C-section, what their home life was like. Mm -hmm. That just sets down a lot of responses, immune responses, stress responses, the microbiome, all of that gets laid down in our childhood. And then walking through big events in life and seeing, you know, what seems to correspond. Then we look at the labs. I do a really comprehensive battery of labs. Mm -hmm. We sit down and go through all of those. And then I make some recommendations. And usually by then I can put pieces together and say like, you're actually, there was someone I saw yesterday, amazing genetics, like really healthy from a genetic standpoint, not as healthy from a relationship standpoint. Longevity, like cholesterol was great, like inflammatory markers, really good. Like all this stuff that I usually see out of balance with people, it's like, wow, you're sailing through. But there's a relationship issue. There's a relationship issue at home. Uh huh. So there's stress from that. And in that kind of a situation, then do you like recommend some kind of relationship work or, or counseling? Or I'm usually really guided to ask questions. Mm -hmm. how how happy are you in your life right now uh -huh. and is this is this the happiest that you want to be in your life uh-huh could you be happier and what would that look like uh-huh huh. just a few questions like that and then if they if they want to think about it some don't some people have you know I ask a question and they're they're really not interested in changing their relationship and then they come in a few months later and they're considering you know what would it look like to not be in this relationship mm -hmm. and that it doesn't mean that you have to leave your relationship it just means that it's okay to explore what mm -hmm. if or how you might change it or improve it yeah and once we can open that door of like what if how could i be happier like the that woman that um didn't want to leave her relationship and then considered leaving her leaving her relationship she'd opened up so much conversation between her and her partner that they've started healing mm -hmm. healing physically too you mean as well as in the relationship the relationship is healing and she's getting stronger uh -huh. and she's feeling better hmm. yeah interesting yep well i looked into holistic health things for most of my adult life and not as a practitioner, but more partly my husband's a holistic practitioner and for animals. And so I've just kind of peripherally been involved in a lot of this. And, I, and I've had chronic issues myself. It seems to me at least like it must be very complex to try to put all this together. The, the body's very complex and it seems like the finding exact causes and, and all that. I really have to admire you if you can get to that point. And I'm wondering how much really it's not such an analytical process, but maybe more of an intuitive process. This is what I hear you suggesting. Right. I used to get really uptight and think I had to do it all right. And I had to think about this and this and this and this and this. And then I realized like the abnormal things are going to float to the top. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's what needs to be addressed first. Mm -hmm. There are going to be a few obvious things to fix because you can't change everything all at once. Mm-hmm. It needs to be done at a pace that's doable. So some people need to get the mercury taken out of their mouth. Oh. Some people need to do an elimination diet and take the alcohol and sugar and, and refined foods out of their diet and just start there. And then there are occasionally people that <laughs> they, they're in bad shape. And then we look at their history and there's, not a lot there. And then we look at their labs and there's not a lot there. Mm -hmm. And I was, wow, this is crazy. And those are the cases usually of mold toxicity. Oh, really? I, yeah. There's a 
mycotoxin exposure at some point uh -huh. in their lives. And, then, and how do you detect that? You know, it's one of those things that you learn to suspect. One of these um, patients, I didn't expect it first off. Not really something that you should expect first off. So we went through all, all the normal things and she said she got about 80% better. So that's 80% yeah. and everything was working better so that when she finally did a little more research on her own and said, I think I might have this. And I looked and I went, mm -hmm. I, that's worth checking out. Mm -hmm. So that's when she started getting into that 20%. But she was at a point health-wise that her body was ready to detoxify. Well, did she have to do a whole remodel on her house or something like that? Or I mean, we're... I can't remember where her mycotoxin exposure came from, honestly. I, I stand in awe. I mean, I think <laughs> you, there must, it just seems like there must be so many things you must have to come to learn and to understand things like that or EMF exposure or uh, effects of over-vaccination or effects of, of GMOs or, or all these things that have entered our world in the last few decades, you know, that, that are, and, and glyphosate in, yeah. in the food. And the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. Yeah. So right. So probably, I, I would imagine you have to learn to accept the limits with which you can help and yes. be okay with it. Cause you're not, you know, there's, you know, a joke about so this guy's, getting a pass into heaven at St. Peter's Gate. And so I said, who's that? That's God. He thinks he's a doctor. <laughs> it's like, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, people treat doctors like, like God. It's like they know everything, maybe even about nutrition, even though they have very little education on it. So I can only imagine what a challenge it could be. So you must have to have some way of accepting your limitations. And stay curious. Yeah. Staying curious. Uh-huh. When you're interviewing people and going into that, you you sometimes get some pretty strong intuitive hits, like it's this thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that's probably not how all fun functional MDs work, though I wouldn't guess. So. Um, maybe yeah. not all, but quite yeah. a few. Uh huh. There are quite a few. I've I've spoken with some that some practitioners that say the absolutely intuition guides me. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So what kinds of interesting stories with, you know, what kinds of conditions have you seen turn around that maybe uh, most doctors are not really seeing results with that practice mm -hmm. conventionally? Well, one of the first cases that I had was a woman who um, was waking up with full body hives mm. <clears throat> and she had fractured her ankle and had a plate put in it about four months before these hives started. So she contacted her orthopedic surgeon and they agreed to take it out. And I, I think we did a detoxification type process, mm -hmm. boosted her immune system and um, then her hives. Uh-huh. Eventually. So, so was that, you think a metallic, a heavy metal kind of? And then, then, you know, I broke my wrist this spring and um, had the plate taken out about four months mm -hmm. later um, because I was getting rashes. Yeah. But the metal that's in, that they use in surgery is titanium or a surgical grade stainless steel, but they are alloys, meaning that they have a mix of metals in them. Uh -huh. Some people are more sensitive than others to metals. Nickel yeah. is a big one. So that would apply to, I imagine, to hip and knee replacements and that kind of thing too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And speaking of that, that's a very common issue. Uh, do you treat many conditions of arthritis in older people and, and have you seen results from being able to prevent that kind of surgery from being necessary? One of the hugest things I've realized since I've been working with Dr. Rosensweet doing hormone replacement therapy is, and that's been for probably about two and a half or three years, mm -hmm. is how much joint pain and back pain is associated with perimenopause and menopause. It's a symptom that's unrecognized mm -hmm. of menopause. 
So I saw a woman yesterday who's 71 years old and she's kind of been on and off yeah. hormone replacement since her menopause, but she was having really debilitating pain in her heels and her back and her shoulders and it's gone. Are we using hormone replacement therapy? It's gone. Is that the bioidentical type that's sort of topically applied? And she is back to doing wow yard work and ballroom dancing. Like, mm -hmm. yep, that's great. That's great. That must be very satisfying when you see results like that. Love it. Yeah, <laughs> I really do. I'm sure it is for the patients too. <laughs> yeah. Now, chronic pain is is really in chronic limitations for mobility and things like that, or or just normal functioning, can be very discouraging for people. Right, and we have not done a good job educating women, and we're trying. We're trying now. It's starting. Mm -hmm. And what are the unusual usual symptoms of menopause? It's not just hot flushes and vaginal dryness. It's cardiac palpitations and anxiety and depression and mood swings, so many things. Mm -hmm. Dry skin. Hypothyroidism yeah. maybe? Yeah, hypothyroidism for sure. I was talking about someone with that, about that with someone just this morning. Mm -hmm. when, the estro when the hormones start to fall, particularly the progesterone, because it sensitizes the thyroid receptor, um, it we become hypothyroid, like the thyroid oh. hormones just don't work as well. So replacing progesterone can really help that. Oh, wow. That's interesting. I have not heard that. So how would um, you differentiate that between say something was more autoimmune? Well, you find antibodies when it's autoimmunity. And that's something autoimmunity tends to be a condition that's manifested through having a leaky gut or hyper uh, permeability of the intestine, the small intestinal lining, so that the food and the, whatever we're exposed to that comes in our mouth and goes through our gut gets it gets right. delayed to the immune system, and then we start to develop antibodies. What would be your opinion about all this increase in gluten sensitivity that a lot of people believe that they have or see results when they do or don't eat wheat? Myself, I've thought that maybe that is partly an associated sensitivity from the presence of glyphosate probably around, yeah. around, you know, killing gut flora in so mm -hmm. much wheat, because which is used to desiccate wheat crops, I think since the, the 1990s. And we've also, they've changed from growing the typical wheat that's grown in Europe. And I can't remember what the name of that is. To I, or something like that. Or... Yeah, I, I corn. And yeah. then we are growing dwarf wheat, which has, puts, Forth a lot more um, wheat per you know, square yeah. foot of crop. And then they treat it with glyphosate as well. And then they've also gone in and genetically engineered it to be even more productive and resistant, which changes even more its genetics and how our body responds to it. And I've protein. noticed that it's relatively hard to get organic wheat products. And we're using wheat all the time, you know, in, in bread and in pasta and and it's just things that people consume almost every day. But when you really start looking at, okay, which one is, uh, is organic wheat in it, it's, you know, not that many. There's just a few brands that do it. Yeah. So it must be hard to, to grow it successfully, I guess, you know, without all this. And there's, I'm sure there's a lot of cross-pollination like there is with corn. Mm -hmm. You can't really grow organic corn next to conventional corn because it it just mm -hmm. the spores yeah. get around yeah yeah mm -hmm. so is, is corn another big thing that you would see it's sensitivity to corn there's seven common food allergens okay. uh, that we these are the ones we use in functional medicine that we eliminate from the elimination diet we generally recommend people do the top five which are gluten and dairy and peanuts and soy and shellfish. Mm -hmm. And corn and eggs are six and seven. But those are also two common allergens. Uh -huh. I figured out myself that I was highly sensitive to corn mm. before I had functional medicine. Mm. Yeah, but mm. 
I remember doing a, an antibody test and it wasn't a typical food antibody test. It was testing protein sequences in foods after they're broken down. And I was sensitive to things in, in the wheat and corn and dairy and some other things. And I thought, I remember asking the woman, it was a dietitian I was doing a consultation with us. I said, what can I eat? Do I need yeah. to eat? Like cakes for a while. She said, no, there's lots you can eat. And sure enough, there's a lot. Yeah, it is sort of restricting though in some ways, but so do you, can you with tests, you feel like reliably, evidentially kind of demonstrate that something would be allergenic for someone or did they have to just do elimination diets? There are, there's, it's hard to say. There's one test that I do like and it checks for the breakdown, the antibodies to small protein sequences that our food is broken down to. Instead of just wheat, it's broken down into many different proteins in wheat, gluten, gliadin, there's one called protein norfin, and um, some, you know, quite a few other proteins, and then checking for antibodies to that. Interesting. So do you find in your patients with people that have, you know, three or four different kinds of things going on that seem to involve different parts of the body and so on, that very often that you've found that they all clear up if you take a more closer look at the underlying causal factors, such as diet or stress or whatever? Absolutely. Sometimes things that do not seem related. Mm -hmm anxiety and eczema and maybe irregular menstrual bleeding. Yeah. Or they all go back to the gut and they all have to do with inflammation. And So how long have you seen it to take for those kinds of things to clear up typically? It depends on the case. Sometimes at the end of the elimination diet, I've had people, I've had people come in and I think, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm going to do for them. No. Like, this is, there's a lot going on here. So I send them away with an elimination diet and they come back, you know, six, eight weeks later and they say, I'm good. I figured it out. Right. Except that the elimination diet, if it eliminates like, you know, especially if you're like, for me, I'm a vegan. And so like, you know, these are a lot of my staples. And so, you right. know, it's like, well, even for a lot of people, I mean, and it's in a lot of food, you know, all the out there, convenience food, et cetera. So what if there's like, you know, three of those things that are really it and it's the other three you could eat? I mean, how would you kind of come to see that? Well, you know, it's a choice. They can try to eat them and take them back, you know, just to see. One at a time. Yeah. Uh -huh. How they do. Does it, it usually take several days or even weeks to see a difference? Or is it usually pretty quick? With an elimination diet? Yeah. So the half-life of the antibodies mm -hmm. is um, 21 days. That antibody response takes about three weeks, at least three weeks. So you would do an elimination diet, say, for these top five or seven or whatever allergens, typically common allergens. And so then if they're better after 21 days, you just reintroduce them one at a time for 21 days each or what? I mean, no, one at a time, uh, you eat it two to three times in one day, and then you stop, and then you wait for four days and see if there are any oh, symptoms. I see. It's very systematic. Mm -hmm. yeah, it sounds, wow. So it sounds like there's probably a fair amount of follow-up involved, right? And I think just the amount of attention that you give to a person this way, you know, going back to the relationship part, the connection that you mentioned, that, you know, is important to have with the patient, with the person, that how often does a person get to spend more than, you know, even five or 10 minutes with an MD, the way right. that the system is set up, the way the insurance companies, you know, code it and all that and limit the amount of time you can spend. So, and that's probably brings up another issue. I imagine that the, the insurance probably doesn't cover all this at this point. No. And I, I was taking insurance for about the first year and a half. Mm -hmm. And at, when they started paying me, they still weren't paying me what I was billing. 
but then it started like getting less and less Mm -hmm. and less when I think they were realizing that I was doing a lot of counseling Mm -hmm. and wasn't ordering a ton of tests and wasn't actually spending a lot of money. I was actually saving them so much money and they had no idea. Saving the insurance company. Oh, right. In the the long term. Right. It's preventive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But then, you know, they were ended up reimbursing me probably 25% of what I was charging and I couldn't work that hard to that much. So you're pretty much a cash basis. Is that a little frustrating sometimes or is it, I mean, in terms of not, not being able to serve certain people? Or It is. It you know. is. And I know that it's it's all priorities. People want to have their hair done. Some people want right. to get their hair done. I think and... speaking from my own experience, having gone to, for chronic issues, having gone to a variety of practitioners that after a while, when you don't see results, you begin to think, well, maybe this would be a waste of money to spend you know, especially if somebody's kind of, you know, pushing their program and like, well, this thing ought to help you. And yeah, okay, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, that's what has come up for me through the years. So it's not just a matter of priority. It's also a matter of discernment. I guess the patient has to try to figure out what would work and what wouldn't. Is there any kind of uh, evidential studies that have been done on the results that functional MDs get versus going to a variety of specialists? Yes, yes. And those are being done at this Cleveland Clinic. Oh. There's a Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Actually, a friend of mine from Flagstaff is now the chair of that. Oh. Uh-huh. And they are doing studies showing that their results are, they're getting better results in the family practice clinic. How significantly so? I can't remember specifics. It was a study that actually was released when I was at a functional medicine training and they, mm-hmm. they, the person that had written the paper was presenting that day. And he said, I, I can finally talk about this. And it's, Nice. Yeah. yeah. I know someone who does a, a lot of education about whole food, plant-based diets and, and other kinds of ways to maintain health. And anyway, she, she's made a comment one time that functional MDs really give a lot of supplements and don't necessarily know what they're doing and overdo it. What would be your response to that? So it's interesting when I started, there were a lot of people that wanted to help me. So some of these supplement companies were saying, okay, what is your autoimmune protocol? Like Mm -hmm. what supplements do you give for autoimmunity? And I would think, okay, so well, it depends on what they need. Yeah. So I'm not going to give everybody the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I could never come up with an autoimmune package or a fatigue package because I needed to know looking at their labs, looking at their lifestyle, what they individually needed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a core, there tends to be a core um, list of supplements that people need, but even that changes. Mm -hmm. Not everybody is a poor methylator. So not everybody needs methylated B vitamins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some people don't. Some people, they do great on omega-3 and 6s. They keep them in balance because their genetics are made that way. With your testing and stuff, you can distinguish a lot of these different issues. Right. Interesting. Very interesting. So it sounds like probably overall, you're pretty glad you went into this. I'm thrilled. (laughs) <laughs> you're, it's, you're, it's keeping it real for me it's keeping yeah. it it's keeping my curiosity going because if I don't have curiosity like nothing's fun and yeah. that was one of the things that happened when I had COVID I remember lying in bed and I thought oh my gosh my curiosity is gone mm. I didn't see anything I had no drive I was so tired so I've started working again on labor and delivery over the past couple months and having the functional medicine knowledge to go in and work with new moms or women in labor, it's like, okay, what's really going on here? Women have come in with back pain into the triage units and a lot of women come in with back pain. So I've been flipping them over and putting them in child's pose and they, you know, oh my gosh, my back feels so much better. It's, it yeah. feels good. Like, okay. So that- <laughs> Medicine. This is yeah, yeah. We learned a lot. <laughs> That's great. 
<laughs> the and the relationship thing is really important too. I remember when I was young, I started getting a lot of chronic, you know, like yeast infections and things like that after some antibiotics and so on. And you know, it just seemed like it was the same kind of cycle of things that didn't really work that well. And finally, at one point, I went to this guy at a free clinic, and he said, "I think the best thing is just to do nothing." <laughs> trust nature to heal and it did get better at that point for a pretty good long while it was interesting and I felt so appreciative of just that connection to the person but also the doctor but also to that sense of innate faith or trust in the body and that that I think that's really a, actually a very big factor too don't you absolutely women in particular but so many doctors visits are, uh, there's a significant percentage, it's over 50% are for depression or anxiety. They just want to talk, really. They want to know things, it's going to be okay. Yeah, and the doctor's uh, assurances or doctor's negative prognostications, I think, can have a major effect. There have been studies done on that. When a physician has a negative attitude or is hurried or does not connect, mm -hmm. the patient does worse. Interesting. Or I imagine also if they say, well, you're going to die in six months, most likely. SIBO effects, of course, too, and no SIBO effects are very important. There was a doctor that was telling us a story about a study they were doing at University of New Mexico in the family practice department. And he said they were randomized to be nice and connect with the patient or to be like not be nice and discount them or be like really flat and not caring. And he went into this room, like he chose like, don't be nice. And he went into this room and he said there was this adorable little girl. He couldn't help himself. <laughs> but he couldn't be nice to her. And I think at the end of the visit, she said something like, I hope you have a better day. <laughs> and he was like, oh, it was so hard. <laughs> I can imagine. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And as part of that relationship, I imagine that also sometimes it must come up for you that, okay, what are people willing to do? You know, some people are willing to make some changes and some people are just kind of not taking care of themselves and, you know, or, or unable to, you know, maybe they're under too much pressure or stress in their lives, don't have time for certain things or money. So there's only so much you can do under those conditions, I imagine. Right. And that's interesting. When I decided to not take insurance, payments anymore. Mm -hmm. I did realize that the people that were coming were serious. Mm -hmm. The people that were coming previously when insurance would cover it were kind mm -hmm. of trying it out, maybe not following up on the recommendations and just wanted to see what I'd say and they wouldn't get their labs drawn or come back. I mean, that was, a, I felt like a total waste of time for everyone. And now I've got people that are committed yeah. and finishing their their paperwork like really quickly and they're like okay I'm ready for the next thing so, oh. okay let's go oh. and I can say as one who has filled out your paperwork <laughs> <laughs> online I should say yeah it's pretty it's pretty intensive thank you for doing that <laughs> sure we'll see where it goes I'm, I'm hopeful <laughs> yeah yeah before we wrap up I wanted to also just something I like to explore with a lot of people you know one of the themes in this show is asking ourselves the question like who are we how are we all connected and what if we are just all expressions fractals in a way of the divine or of source god whatever we call it and when one of us sort of wakes up or be, or their consciousness becomes expanded or greater does that somehow spread to others apparent others i mean just kind of that issue of our connectedness yeah, I have to say that every person I work with, I feel like I see them in their full potential. Mm -hmm. That's great. When when we can get them feeling better, help the weight, or drain the depression from their expression, like what could they be like? Yeah, what if they were just completely healthy and happy? Yeah, and, and vibrant. Yeah. That is surely very important. There seems like there's a, a really a great potential for healing in the human body. I think there's an amazing potential. And it it's limited, I think, a lot of times by our own perspective, our own stories, 
our own limitations? How can we release them to step into full potential? Because mm -hmm. I understand it, we're we're capable of far, far more than we even think we could, even we could dream we are capable of. I have noticed definitely that attitude enters in. And so when there's thoughts that come up, oh, here goes that symptom again, here goes that, that's just who I am. That's not helpful. You know, it's like, and if you can drop that more and more, that I would think that's really a key part to healing. Agreed. Are there any books that you recommend um, on that topic or on any other topics? There's a book called Full Catastrophe Living written by John Kabat-Zinn, and it, it's um, about his mindfulness-based stress reduction course that impacted me so strongly when I took it mm -hmm. uh, when I was working at the Community Health Center in Flagstaff that I became a teacher of it. I would say, you know, developing a mindfulness practice where you can, where one can learn to separate themselves from what's happening, just take a breath and give space so we can choose which way we want to go. I think that having that skill is like the first thing to work on. That makes sense. It really does. Yeah. When you think about the guy that was in the concentration camps, Victor Frankl, it was take a breath and then respond. If someone can live in a concentration camp, or even Nelson Mandela, if he can live in solitary confinement, come out the beautiful human that he did, he really learned to put space between himself and what was happening. Mm -hmm. And saw himself as a unique individual separate from his circumstances. Yeah. I was a counselor for some years and uh, after exploring various things that would go into the all the the negative feelings and the memories and all that kind of stuff and and trying to you know to kind of reframe or work with some of that stuff it seemed always like a lot of work someone suggested that I look into this approach that was more wellness based and it was just it's actually very similar to mindfulness in the sense of slowing down seeing thoughts that come up it's just thoughts just thoughts they're not reality necessarily at all and going into that quiet place inside right. that there's an inherent well of of well-being if you will of health of insight and of vitality in, in each of us mm -hmm. that's bigger than anything our minds can figure out for sure yeah so if people wanted to work with a functional md uh, is there an organization or a list somewhere that they could go to and and from what i understand like if they wanted to work with you that they'd have to basically live in Arizona or Washington where you're licensed right? and you are accepting new patients. So we can put a, some contact uh, information down below. Yes, yes. Otherwise, mm -hmm. then what would you suggest? Yeah, the site IFM, Institute for Functional Medicine, ifm.org. Mm -hmm. And then right there on the first page, it's, it says find a practitioner. Mm -hmm. And put in your zip code and right. find a practitioner. And there are different organizations or not that have different approaches to it? And There are different um, organizations that teach functional medicine. IFM is, has positioned themselves with probably the most rigorous certification exam and process. Mm -hmm. So people coming out of there are high quality. And the people that are writing books that are known online... Mark Hyman, um, Amy Myers, Sarah Gottfried, those are all Institute for Functional Medicine mm -hmm. practitioners, high quality. Uh huh. So that would be the way to find somebody if you live in some of those other states. And uh, I imagine a lot of practitioners can work online or not. You can work online to a certain extent. There's, you know, in functional medicine, we are taught a lot. Um, in the physical exam, you can tell a lot from the physical mm -hmm. exam. When I first opened my practice, as I was opening my doors, I was working downtown at the farmer's market in Flagstaff. They let me set a table up just outside the entrance to the farmer's market. And so I was um, doing fingernail analysis. So I would look at people's fingernails and there are things you can tell by mm. looking at fingernails. 
mm-hmm. like the spots and the ridges and the- it's something that doctors used, used to do a lot more than they do now. I mean, you know, my husband's told me that having graduated from veterinary school in 1965, it's really changed. I mean, there used to be lots of of ways that people would check, you know, hands on and that they don't do anymore. It's all about labs. A lot of physical exam findings that are important. We'll put a link to that information down below for those who'd like to explore this further. Yes, thank you. Well, Beth, it's really, Dr. Claxton, <laughs> it's really been a privilege and an honor to speak with you today about all this. And thank you. I want to thank you for having the courage and the commitment and the love that it, it surely has taken to go into this kind of work. Thank you. Thank curiosity. you. Curiosity for sure. I, I wouldn't have done it any other way. No, sure. it's an open mind and open heart. That's what's needed. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for watching. And if you like this kind of content, these deep conversations, open door, open mind, open heart looks at people's lives and what's going on in the world today from a spiritual point of view, then please hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Thank you.